Well, welcome everybody to another HydroTerra webinar. Today, we're learning all about ecological rehabilitation of landfills using phytocapping, future opportunities and potentials. We've got two presenters today, both from Griffith University, Dr. Ruby Michael, who's founder of Green Infrastructure Research Labs, and Vishal Radha Prasad Chilaparumbul. Sorry, I didn't do that very well, did I, Vishal? We're going to call him Vishal from now on. Um, both of those are experts in landfill rehabilitation, particularly the ecological side of things. So very lucky to have the two presenters here today. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Bunwarung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Here's a picture of our two presenters. and a little bit about our presenters. So firstly, Dr. Ruby Michael. Ruby is an ecological engineer and the founder of Green Infrastructure Research Labs at Griffith University, which is a transdisciplinary engineering, architecture, design, and ecology laboratory dedicated to the reinstatement of soil plant ecosystems across the domains of waste, water sensitive urban design and a wide range of green infrastructures. Ruby is an international phytocap expert with more than 20 years of experience in design, research, performance monitoring and full scale delivery of phytocap projects. You might ask yourself, how did Ruby end up doing all of that? Well, Ruby grew up in New Zealand for the first 14 years of her life living on a really remote island and fell in love with nature there by the sounds of things. She then came to Australia, ended up at the University of Melbourne and through a uh, program with Hanson, managed to get a paid PhD and uh, was involved in one of the first phytocap projects in Melbourne at the Willert Landfill. Uh, so quite a journey there, and it's great to have you here, Ruby. Vishal, Vishal is an environmental and mechanical engineer who recently submitted his PhD. Well, in fact, he's actually now officially been told he has been successful with his doctorate. So this is uh, his first occasion as officially a doctor. So congratulations, Vishal. Uh, his research investigating the ecological rehabilitation of landfills in Queensland, exploring the role of phytocapping in achieving beneficial after-use outcomes for landfills post-closure. He has conducted interviews and surveys with industry experts to identify current practices, opportunities and barriers related to phytocapping in Queensland. Additionally, he has developed a GIS-based spatial analysis tool to evaluate and quantify the ecological values of landfills in the region. He will be presenting for the first time today an to an Australian audience. So it's very cool what Vishal has put together there and it's going to be a really good tool for guiding councils and landfill operators in what's the best landfill to rehabilitate from an ecological perspective. So it's, it's very excellent. How did Vishal end up here today? Well, Vishal was born in Oman. He grew up in India in a place that he refers to as God's own country. It was full of wild animals and he had such a love for animals. He pursued a, a passion of photography of wildlife. Um, then took a, uh, a step sideways into mechanical engineering. So he studied mechanical engineering and worked for Volvo for a while before realising his true passion 
was for the environment and the animals and things that live in it. So he came to Australia in 2018, did a master's in environmental engineering and pollution, and then met up with Ruby, who saw someone bright to do a PhD, and uh, the rest is history. So well done, Vishal, on getting your PhD, and uh, it's great to have you both here to present today. For uh, we let loose with the presentation, we love your questions and a fantastic number of early bird questions for this one. Really good to see. Um, questions during the presentation can be raised through the Q&A button, which is at the top of your screen. I will read those questions out to the presenters at the end and they will do their best to answer. Why does Hydroterra do these webinars? Well, we love to share knowledge and there's all these great things going on out there like we're about to see today, but we've found that uh, we're not great at communicating them in Australia. So we're doing our best to facilitate some education and provide some industry leadership. Um, this, this, pro, this presentation today is um, one that sort of came to mind a bit out of, we recently did some training um, in landfill sampling and it was at the Darabin Parklands. And it's a really good example of turning what was once a landfill into a beautiful landscape. So this one's been going for a long time, but it is a pretty good vision of what could have been a real eyesore, like an old quarry and landfill and turned it into a beautiful open space. So just shows what can be done. So today we've got two experts who are going to uh, explain to us how we can do it best. So without further ado, I will pass over to Ruby. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction, Richard, and it's a pleasure to be here. And, and thank you to Hydroterra for providing this forum and opportunity for us. I do agree that we don't get together enough to share knowledge. Um, and this webinar format is very efficient and good for um, communicating to an online audience. Um, so today, sorry, ecological rehabilitation of landfills, future opportunities and potentials. Uh, just adding on, I guess, our acknowledgement of country. Um, Michelle and I are based in Queensland, and um, we would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting today, but also where our studies have been conducted um, over many years, and also acknowledge country as an agent in all of the work that we do as well. So the presentation structure today is firstly, Vishal is going to kick off um, with his work on ecological rehabilitation of landfills in Queensland opportunities, barriers and practices. And um, that's just going to be a snapshot really of some of the work that he's done in his PhD. Um, there's more to come and uh, explore. And um, that'll be more of a high level presentation. And then I will just um, communicate some of the good old fundamentals of wider capping, which I don't think get enough attention sometimes to do with um, the importance of soil specification um, for creating optimum um, plant body use and root growth conditions and also phytocat plant selection. Um, so I think I'm just going to kick on over to Vishal now. Over to you, Vishal. Uh, thanks, Ruby and Richard. Uh, hi, everyone. I'll be starting by looking at some of uh, international examples for ecological rehabilitation of landfills. Uh, the, there has been an increasing trend of uh, ecological afteruse of landfill internationally, some of them successful, some of them not not really. Uh, but here I'm giving a few of the examples, some well known and some not that much known. So first one is pretty known one, Fresh Kill Parks from the Fresh Kill Landfill in New York, which was the largest landfill in the world at the time, almost 2,200 acres. And now it has been uh, slowly converted into grasslands, waterways, and engineered structured like um, uh, sports, sporting fields, which they are planning to have ecological outcomes and also community benefits on them. And the second one, and the uh, second one is uh, Mainburg landfill in Germany, 
which is uh, converted into solar field accompanied by um, uh, flower meadows and grassland and um, to achieve a multi-beneficial outcome from the landfill closure. And they have included uh, 50 different type of uh, habitats in in between this um, uh, in the in between this solar panels uh, by using like boulders and uh, wood and um, root structures and all that stuff to create habitat for native reptiles, amphibians, and bird nesting area. And third one is less known but it's a good example is Mahin uh, Natural Park in Mumbai. And this was a community driven and community in initiated rehabilitation project where community uh, did all the work. And uh, now after 20 years, it's known as Green Lung of Mumbai City. As most of you know, Mumbai City is not known for the air quality and this uh, rehabilitated landfill actually helps in uh, improving the air quality. And it also provides habitat for the wetland species, which was there before and uh, uh, access a passive recreational area for people in the city. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And now let's look at why ecological rehabilitation of landfill is important. As we know, commodity driven deforestation and habitat loss is happening throughout a uh, different part of the world, uh, especially recently, in recent decades. And there has been a call for ecological rehabilitation and restoration projects to uh, help reduce the human driven effects. And um, in case of landfills, landfills represent a large parcel of land normally, which cannot be built upon because of its unstable nature. And this provides an excellent op opportunity to reestablish ecological processes and create habitats on this area. An additional benefit that comes with ecological rehabilitation is low ongoing maintenance. As uh, most of you would know, um, landfills after closure and capping needs ongoing maintenance for a long time. Uh, but with the uh, established uh, natural si uh, system, uh, what happens is it reduces the ongoing maintenance required. Further, it provides opportunity for community engagement and provide access for the community to a green space, which will in, in, in turn help to reduce uh, or break the stigma around landfills and waste management industry in general, where people see it as a dirty business. And uh, let's look at the Queensland context. Uh, here you can see the first map I'm showing the species density in Queensland. As you can see, the highest density is near the east coast of Queensland. Next one. And uh, looking at the landfill density, it uh, correlates with the species density. The density of landfill, the number, highest number of landfill is concentrated in regions with highest species density as well. And also, if you're looking at the biographic regions with highest uh, landfill density, that's where there's large number of endangered species. So this shows in Queensland, there's an opportunity to use the landfills. Uh, if ecological rehabilitated, they can provide uh, possibly provide uh, habitat for endangered species as well. And next one. And now let's look at the uh, opportunities and barriers. Uh, we have conducted uh, around 38 online surveys and 12 interviews with waste management experts from Queensland. And this is to examine and understand current practices and opportunities and barriers for ecological rehabilitation of landfills. And this included interviews with the uh, local and state government officials, waste management consultant, landfill managers, ex-regulator, academics. And from this, we got, we understood a uh, lot of barriers and opportunities here. I'm uh, giving you some of them, which makes sense uh, for this presentation. So uh, with barriers, what we found with ecological reputation is lack of incentives is one of the major barrier for ecological rehabilitation and uh, or any kind of after use that has to be considered. And uh, lack of knowledge in the industry, especially with e ecology, when it comes to ecology and uh, mostly waste management industry is uh, made up of engineers and lack of knowledge on ecology is one of the contributing factor. And another thing is lack of understanding of benefits and incentives that can be achieved 
from uh, ecological regulation. So this is why we uh, looked into a tool that can give that knowledge uh, to the landfill owners so they can make informed decision. And the last one is lack of expertise in the industry, especially among consultants. Uh, uh, who doesn't have expertise in natural-based solutions, they always go for hard-engineered solutions. And um, with opportunities, uh, what we found out is like um, eco ecological rehabilitation projects, uh, especially in landfill space, gives them opportunity to uh, develop ecosystems and uh, provide um, uh, uh, restoration of native flora and fauna can contribute to the local green spaces, especially this is in build-up areas where there is a lack of green spaces. And uh, additionally, it is a cost-effective and environment sensitive after use to have for a landfill. Yeah, next one. And uh, to gather deeper, deeper understanding of some of these findings, we did the interview and from the interview, we found a lot of different themes. We are only discussing two here. And the first one here uh, is uh, that parks and ecology, re ecological rehabilitated areas uh, are not uh, plan, but rather occurred spontaneously. So you can see from the codes are included in there to support it, uh, that um, the first participant states that uh, their landfill is already having vegetation, even without a cap, and that's what nature does. And also looking at the second one, you can see uh, the the participants stating a lot of landfills in Queensland have trees growing on them. They're talking about the old ones and people pretend they are parklands. This shows uh, how these landfills, which has parks on it, ended up being parks. It's not by planning, it's more by natural succession. And the second theme we are going to look at today is landfill after use planning is not prioritized. Uh, from the first participant, we can see that their site, they don't have any plan uh, for uh, after use. What the only plan they have is to close it, isolate it, and fence it. And from the second participant, you can see that uh, you can understand why this is happening. So they're stating all the money and resources when a landfill closes go to finding a new landfill rather than having a proper closure and after use plan for that landfill. Okay. Next, please. Yeah. So as we, as I mentioned before, there is a lack of um, lack of knowledge on understanding what's the benefit of ecology reputation of their site. So this is why we considered uh, creating a tool which is robust and easy to access. That's why we gone with GIS, which is easily accessible for engineers, and uh, most of council uh, do have um, access to uh, GIS. And uh, this methodology was published uh, and also a case study using this methodology was uh, presented at Sardinia. If you're interested, you can uh, read about this in the link provided. And uh, next one. Okay, so let's look at the case study we have done. And uh, for this case study, we consider Southeast Queensland. And uh, because of that, we have taken koalas as an umbrella species, as a representation, a representation of the ecosystems in Southeast Queensland. And because of that, we considered two uh, buffers around the landfill. The first buffer is 400 meter. This represents the, this is the maximum distance a koala travels in a day to another location. And the 3.5 kilometer buffer was considered uh, because that's the distance a koala travel to find or establish a new habitat. And these two buffers represent uh, habitat creation opportunity to for koala to come in and also habitat connectivity where two patches can uh, connect uh, if, if you look uh, from a koala perspective. And next one. So just before we do, so does that mean is there an assumption that if it's less than 500 meters, it's not a adequate space for a koala? Uh, uh, it's not, I'm um, not talking about the size of the habitat. It's the distance between two habitats. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I'm trying to find what's in the 500 meter and then that means they can travel in between. Gotcha. Thank yeah. You. 
And uh, for this case study, we used Berkta landfill, which is a medium-sized landfill in Redland Bay City region. That's the first engineered landfill in that region. And um, it's, uh, it, it's surrounded by housing area and small patches of conservation parks. And uh, you can see from the photo, they had a, a rehabilitation plan to have a community after use for the site because of the beautiful view of Morton Bay Island from the top of the landfill because it's a small hill. And um, uh, in this region, there's an issue of habitat fragmentation and uh, traffic incidents because of that, where if there's like a lot of fragmentation, animals has to cross the roads and they get hit by cars. But uh, where, with this uh, rehabilitation of this landfill, what happened is like they didn't achieve their planned outcome. As you can see from the second photo, it's right now uh, transfer station, which uses a small area, and rest of it is a ball hill. Um, and from our study, we identified there is, uh, in the 500 meter buffer, there is a lot of small habitat patches, which is called, called habitat patches. And uh, by looking at it, you can see the brown part is the landfill. If used for ecological rehabilitation, that could have established a new habitat and also connected some of the small patches and created a larger patch, providing opportunity uh, for a larger habitat patch in the region and also reduce the traffic incident because uh, when there's smaller patches, they tend to travel more. Okay, next slide, please. And in this one, 3.5 kilometer buffer, we looked at where biological significant uh, ecosystems. And as you can see, there's a large number of smaller and large patches of uh, state significant ecosystem and state significant ecosystem for endangered animals as well in the 3.5 kilometer buffer. This shows this uh, opportunity for creating connectivity, especially if the patch in the middle is bigger that provides opportunity for travel in between. And uh, next one. Next, we are going to uh, look at the evaluation and prioritization part of the tool. Uh, the one before we looked at and identify what's around the landfill. In this, we are going to evaluate and use that value to prioritize the landfill. Uh, so landfill ecological value assessment was done by looking at surrounding what's surrounding the landfill and what's the value of land around the landfill. We used a multi-criteria approach and GIS to evaluate this ecological value. And uh, with GIS, what we used is uh, uh, buffer overlay analysis. And uh, similar to the identification, we use 500 meter buffer. We want to look at most influential area around the landfill. And for this purpose, we used um, 12 state significant environment features ranging from statewide corridors and buffer to endangered species habitat. From this, uh, after overlaying, we, we did calculations and created two novel scores, which represents the ecological value of that land. Uh, and uh, with this scores, we named it environmental and habitat score. Environment score shows what uh, what's the total area of these features in the uh, in the buffer, and habitat scores represents uh, total number of individual patches in this area. Next, and these are the two environment features we used to uh, do EVA. We used uh, uh, different matters of state significant uh, ecosystem data, which is uh, wildlife habitat, certain species, species of least concern, fish habitat, and remnant vegetation cover, Queensland statewide corridors, wetland protected area, uh, UNC protected area, natural refuges, and uh, because we're in Queensland, koala habitats, different uh, koala habitat regions. Okay. Next one. So, um, did you yeah. find those layers were suitably up to date to really? Um, so most of them are. So that when I selected these data, I, I made a conscious effort to have most up to date data and authoritative data, uh, because uh, these are produced by state government. They can be, uh, they they are the most accurate available data. Okay. And this is an example of an EVA done for landfills in Gold Coast. And this is what a landfill owner would get if they do it. So this shows you how these two, uh, two, two, two scores can be ranked 
to create a ranking criteria. And from this, um, what we can do is like, because most of the council or landfill owners would have limited resources and they want to prioritize few landfills that they can have most amount of benefit from ecological reputation. That's where this comes in to play. And uh, if you look at this one, if the council want to select three landfill they want to rehabilitate, they would have to select the last three one, which has the highest rating for environment score and also habitat score. That shows if you rehabilitate these landfills, you already have a lot of number of smaller patches in there and also a lot of area of them. That means if you add to that, that would add overall value in that area. And um, you can also see this, there are some transfer stations in there. For my study, I have included transfer stations because uh, some of these transfer stations are unrehabilitated old legacy landfills, which can be rehabilitated and can have ecological rehabilitation outcome as well. And they only use small part of the landfill for as a transfer station. Okay, next one. So to conclude, uh, I'll just uh, conclude with some of the positive outcomes from ecological rehabilitation of landfill. It's a sustainable long-term closure option for landfills. And further, uh, with incentives, uh, it, it, uh, it, give, it gets the landfill owners in a position to capitalize on the emerging natural repair market and also gives them with carbon credit opportunities. Additionally, benefit for the community, which is providing green space in build up areas and passive recreational benefits. And this has to be done in the design stage. So if you include, uh, for example, if the community need mountain biking area or bushwalk or viewing deck, it depends on the profile of the landfill and what the community needs, they can have that benefit. And this means it uh, it has a long-term sustainable, uh, sustainable benefit, climate resilience and help break stigma around waste industry where people see it as a dirty business. And with EVA, uh, it shows the ISS efficient tool uh, and easy to access tool. That's the main point and efficient in doing uh, in environment value uh, assessment. And this would help the landfill owners with making informed decision when it comes to landfill after use. And next one. Just before we do, Vishal, so yeah. you mentioned that a, a few of these GIS layers are the state-based layers. Yeah. Does that mean the tool is only suitable for use in Queensland at this stage? Yeah, so um, th th that's where the multi-criteria approach uh, comes in. I have made the tool in such a way that it can be, it can be changed for each individual landfill owner. So sometimes, so the, if all the all the uh, features used are weighted. So this weighted a weighting currently is given according to the research team. But if a landfill owner values a specific feature more than other, it can be weighted up, and that would change the value, and that would give you the best outcome from which landfill for that specific feature. And with rest of the uh, state in Australia, uh, we currently only have the database set up for Queensland, but if the landfill owner from different state uh, wants it to be done, the, the same process has to be followed and we have to create a database uh, to establish that in the in their state. Yeah. And yeah. my understanding is you're wanting to offer this as a service in the future. Is that right? Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so that would be through Griffith University, would it, if people... Uh, yes, that would be through Green Infrastructure Research Labs. Okay. Yeah. All right. And the next one, and to end with, this is a good example of uh, a pyro cap that had uh, ecology ecological consideration given during the design process on the right top uh, right end top right end you can see the top view almost more than 90 percent of canopy coverage in uh, three to four years and already you can see it's being um, used by native flora and fauna on the left uh, top you can see that's a black cockatoo and next to it is a double banded finches. That's a pair of them. Uh, and on the bottom, you can see that's a desert tree frog and um, a leaf footed bug. 
uh, they're pretty colorful <laughs> and you can see already like with uh, a little bit of consideration given during the design process they can add a lot of value uh, into into the site okay and to talk more about um, uh, plant selection and soil i would hand over to dr ruby michael Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Richard, how long do I have in total just so I can make sure that I keep to a good amount of time? Uh, good question. <laughs> or I can just go for it. I'll try to be quick. You, you keep going for it. I'll tell okay. you. We have a bit of a history here and going over time. So okay. Well, good well. afternoon, everyone. It has just reached afternoon in Queensland as well. It's 12 p.m. Um, here. Uh, I'm going to talk about soil and plants, essentially, and the first uh, part of my presentation, uh, more focused on the soil, um, it's based on a paper that was very recently published, I think in the last week, uh, Soil Density Specification Ranges to Optimise Plant Water Use and Root Growth, and I did present a subset of this research as well at the Sardinia Conference um, in 2023. Um, it's an open access paper. Um, and the link is there and you're welcome to to follow up with it. So I guess um, understanding there might be a couple of people who haven't um, caught wind of what phytocapping is. Um, I guess uh, Vishal was talking about ecological rehabilitation of landfilling, but just to hone in on phytocapping in particular, it is a nature-based engineering uh, landfill capping solution that has the potential to turn landfills into urban forests. Uh, it is an alternative to some of our clay and geosynthetic caps, and its main um, uh, engineering um, function and process, which allows it to contain waste, is it has a layer of soil which holds water, and the plant community is essential for extracting that water to achieve um, the hydraulic containment outcomes. Um, of course, that is our primary focus, um, achieving safe and stable uh, waste containment, but nature-based solutions, as they always do, provide a whole range of other uh, benefits, and some of them Vishal's alluded to, including restoring biodiversity um, in southeast Queensland, in particular koala habitat, connecting corridors, and um, potential for urban recreation. And landfills are often quite large areas, um, and uh, we we have we have kind of been chipping away at our natural areas, especially in built up environments. So I think there is a real um, imperative that we do consider um, ecological potentials for these sites as a as a valued after use. Okay, and of course, um, oh, there's a gift there, but yes, they rely essentially the function relies on the power of power of um, and function of living. Um, things, um, predominantly plants, um, for their hydraulic containment potential. Okay, next slide. So good fighter cap design, um, naturally as it relies on soils and plants, um, needs to be grounded in good soil design and good plant design. And in fact, uh, good fighter cap design is a nexus between the two. So in terms of our um, engineering design variables, we are in a situation where we're rebuilding an ecosystem from scratch. We're, we've got wait, a pile of, um, uh, we have a waste mass pile of waste and we're putting a cap on top of it. So unlike in a natural ecosystem, we um, have some control over the soil that we choose, um, which can often be some kind of um, uh, on-site material or um overburden or it could be um, a soil sourced from a development so we get to choose the soil type we also get to choose how that soil is arranged and um, that's the uh, really the focus of this presentation so we choose the thickness and we also choose um, the compaction um, and then we choose the plant types and we also choose how the plants are arranged and it's that relationship between the two that are really important and I think I'm going to go into that in the next slide a little bit more detail with these key um, phytocap design variables. So if you click through all of those animations, please. So we choose um, uh, the substrate type. It um, could be sandy loam, clay loam, mine, spoil, or a fill. 
We choose the thickness. I think the most common thickness that we see around the place is 1.5 meters. Amazing how often the modeling shows us that it's exactly 1.5 meters, um, uh, definitely in Victoria. And um, in, in wetter climates, we might go up to two, two meters um, or even thicker. Um, the substrate density is um, whether we place it extreme at um, a soft, medium or hard uh, soil density. Um, and then we choose the types of species and the functional types of species. So are we looking at restoring a native grassland community, uh, shrubland um, or tree species or a mixture of the three um, different uh, functional types? And how are we going to space them across the cap is another important consideration. Next slide, please. So in this particular um, study was based uh, at the Waller landfill uh, using um, quarry scalpings, which is a gravel sand clay mixture. Um, not necessarily ideal properties, low water holding capacity, high hydraulic conductivity, low organic matter, um, low nutrients, and also high pH. So a few challenges there. Um, next slide, please. And so the very first thing we need to do when we're looking at a material, it doesn't necessarily rule it out. Um, and I'll go into this more in the in the plant selection uh, plant um, selection part of the presentation. But we needed to select plants that had tolerances to that particular uh, material. Now the landfill was located on the western basalt plains, so there were plant communities that are well adapted to those conditions. And we needed to um, choose, based on those conditions, uh, plants that were adapted to drought, that were tolerant of highly alkaline conditions, that had um, were also tolerant of low soil fertility, and also um, tolerant of flooding, because flooding allows them some, um, you, we don't want plants that are sensitive to flooding in case there is a landfill gas inundation um, into the soil profile, which has an analogous effect to flooding. Um, we also, as part of this study, prioritised um, biodiversity, uh, the selection of indigenous species and um, making sure that we also select grasses for erosion control, even if they're not um, a dominant part of the final plant community that you're choosing, uh, grasses are always needed um, to hold together and make sure that you have um, slope stability and don't have that sediment runoff. Next, please. So this particular trial was um, a highly controlled glasshouse trial. Um, so the materials were taken from full scale landfill site, um, but the densities, um, because the, the main focus of this trial was on the specification of soil density, basically prepared four levels um, of soil density um, in percent, percent uh, standard maximum dry bulk density in the laboratory. So um, that was done with a hydraulic ram and um, precisely um, controlled depth and layering to make sure that they were consistent throughout the one point, um, 0 0.5 metre tall uh, pots. So we created four different densities, 72%, 77%, 82%, and 87% of relative compaction or percentage maximum dry bulk density. This was uh, replicated five times for each of six different plant species, and then they were kept um, continuously rotated under semi-controlled glasshouse conditions to make sure that there was no bias to any particular type of density. Next slide, please. And so just looking at some of the results. Um, so this glasshouse trial looked at a few different things. Firstly, um, Plant water use was measured continuously throughout the, the trial by weighing. So um, weekly, um, I would actually go and <laughs> visit the pots and actually put them on the scales. So um, got quite strong doing that. Um, uh, so that would basically, um, we knew the, the input of water and um, we could see how um, much um, the soil mass was losing in terms of water every week. And so they were kept under um, drying conditions, which meant that the soil strength was also very high. 
Um, and the second thing that was measured at the end of the experiment was actually um, the, the plants were all uh, sacrificed and um, the soil cords were dismantled and the root length density, which is the amount of roots per uh, unit, um, uh, cubic unit of soil was measured along with the root diameter. So what we found is that there was actually a relationship between root length density and plant water use. Um, as you would expect, it wasn't, um, uh, it had a lot of scatter because we have a lot of variability in terms of six different plant species, but you do see generally the more roots that you have in a soil profile, the more plant water use you um, um, are getting. And so what's the relevance of this to phytocaffeine? It's it's just extremely important that you realize that you're creating a, a soil root matrix um, in addition to the plants that you see above the surface. Um, that level of soil compaction that you have is influencing um, the root growth that you're getting and the water extraction that you're getting. So we did find that in particular grasses had a large correlation between those facts, the, the plant water use and root length density. And essentially there was a little bit of a relationship. 20-25% um, of the root length density was equivalent to the plant water use. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> That's that's based on a single species, yeah? So uh, six different species. So you have four different tree species and, and two different grass species. Um, the, the red that you can see on there is actually the relationship of the grasses. Yeah. And interestingly, you can see there's some much higher root length densities um, occurring for some of those grasses. The trees were all um, much lower. Is there a direct um, link between leaf area index and, and the root density? Uh, it wasn't measured in this particular experiment, but there definitely is plants um, quite intelligently petition um, between the leaf area and the and the roots, depending on the water conditions and the compaction conditions as well. Okay. So they make kind of strategic decisions about how to maintain their their internal systems and resilience. Do they really think Ruby or? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of really interesting research around plant sensing because, um, uh, you know, they do they do have the, uh, yeah, I can share that research with you later, but definitely the, <laughs> the, the root tip has hairs on it and, um, you know, it has geotrophism, which is, means it's able to sense gravity. And actually, if you take that off, the plant can no longer tell which way is down. So there is some really, uh, there's some interesting um, <laughs> aspects to that. And I, I would say um, it, it's, it is quite important to think of them as living uh, living beings, which they are, um, in order to get the best outcome for your project. So other results here, and, and sorry that I can't go more into more detail on the method, but this is more of a summary of where we ended up at the end. Um, so this is actually going back to the question of soil density specification. So on the left-hand side, we have two graphs overlaid. Um, the blue graph is a relationship between plant water use and soil density. And you can see it's a softer par parabola um, which has an optimum, um, and you can see that optimum is around 77%. So that's where we're seeing the most um, plant water use. And you can see that that starts to decline as density increases, and less so um, as density decreases. The green parabola is uh, root length density, a much more symmetrical parabola with a slightly higher optimum. And you can see that root length density actually declines both at low density and high density, um, which is actually quite an interesting result. Um, and on the right hand side, we have a combined parabola, that pink parabola, which is basically just showing, this is um, a relationship that optimizes for both plant water use and root length density. Um, so basically, yeah, you can go on to the next slide, thank you. Um, if any of this has been a little uh, hard to digest, you can take your time and read the actual paper um, with a little bit more information. Um, so these are just some of the headline, I guess, results. 
Um, the, the strength of the study was that density was very uh, well controlled. Um, so there were um, strong differences between our density treatments. Um, you can see um, if, uh, so we've got specifications if we were just optimizing for root length density is that second column, if we were just optimizing for plant water use and also if we were optimizing for both. Um, and you can see that there's quite a wide range um, 74 to 84% were actually, um, which is a 10% max, uh, percent maximum dry density range, which is very achievable with full-scale machinery, you can get a good outcome. Um, you can get an even better outcome if you narrow your density range. But as you get too sloppy with your um, placement techniques, or you start to get too high a density, you start to really uh, lose um, a lot of water extraction and potential root growth um, for, for not much um, of an increase or decrease in density. So just um, the next slide might help you visualize that a bit better. Is it a transitional thing though, Ruby? Like it might take a bit longer to get established, but it'll be. Um, I think, uh, could you just go into the next slide, please? Um, so, so I think um, that is true. I guess with a fighter cat scenario, we are putting plants in a really um, difficult situation to begin with. It's usually a dry, barren slope with high exposure um, if we're putting and and also usually no irrigation um, post um, the early stages of watering so i guess the intelligent thing i i believe to do is to create the best growing conditions to allow them to flourish and become as resilient as possible if you have present like if you do have high compaction there is a chance that the plants remain stunted for life and never really quite reach their potential or their roots are not really um you know fully exploiting the soil profile so if we want a good uh resilient fighter cap the the optimum is for them to not it's not too loose and not too hard and it's just you get proliferation of the roots um throughout the entire soil matrix um, and I guess the good thing is that soil density is actually usually the optimum for holding water as well, because there's kind of a relationship there. So because we all know that water sticks to the outside of, outside of soil particles. And if those voids are just the right amount, you get like a good um, water holding capacity. So this is kind of just the summary of that. You can see that at that moderate density, close to 80 percent, you really have excellent plant water use and excellent um, root growth as well. And that's what we should be aiming for. And you can see that, I guess the take home message is intermediate, moderate soil densities are going to optimize plant performance. I would still, if you don't, I mean, sometimes, you know, with a full scale machine um, bulldozers, um, you may just reach 85 um, without too much effort. Um, in that case, it would be much better to place the soil without any compaction whatsoever and go down the lower range and allow some self-weight compaction that will occur um, from the placement of the soil mass. Um, so, yep, next slide, please. <laughs> so just uh, in terms of the implications for practice, we should be uh, specifying um, and trying to achieve soil densities as close to excellent or at least good as possible and really not going outside that fair range. Um, soil densities are commonly specified, interestingly, above 85% for fighter caps, uh, really unnecessarily and creating uh, suboptimal conditions. It's very, it's kind of like, it's hard to unscramble an egg, so it's hard to decompact a, a too compacted um, cap. So I guess, um, yes, that would be my take home message. It's not hard. Um, uh, place your soils lightly and um, you will achieve better quality ecological rehabilitation outcomes and give the plant community a fair go. Okay. <laughs> um, have I got time to continue a little on plants? 10 minutes of official. Um, okay, I can do that. Really. And then we'll move to questions. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks everyone for your patience. So I'm just going to talk more about the plant selection process. Um, we do spend a fair bit of time on soil because we love soils and because of our predominantly civil engineering background. Um, but plants are the main performers in a fighter cap system. So you're going to get better outcomes if you spend good time on plant selection. And so I have outlined some foundations of what makes good plant selection for fighter caps. Four pillars um, to this approach. So the first is to understand your soil constraints. The second one is to match those with your indigenous ecosystems where possible. The third is to look at how much that natural ecosystem context has been altered by the landfill context and make adjustments. The fourth is to overlay as many multiple benefits as you can, because why not? We're trying to create a flourishing and really excellent um, gold standard uh, rehabilitation outcome for your site and put these four things together um, to create a good plant selection criteria, which is one more click away, I think. There we go. And um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through those points. Um, soil constraints. It's not just about the physical, but the physical is important. You can click through for what's on the slide. Um, Physical constraints are, and um, opportunities are really important. We do need to understand the hydrological and geotechnical performance of our soils um, from a civil um, hydrological perspective. However, from a plant perspective, also very important that we check out the chemical characteristics and make sure that there are no major limitations to plant growth. And just evaluate, it doesn't have to be a huge job, but not understanding whether there's macro and micronutrient issues, um, and especially if there's contamination, heavy metals or other pollutants that could cause um, problems for your site. It's really not worth using those materials and putting them down. But the other thing that understanding these constraints does is um, it enables you to start thinking about what plants are gonna be most suited to your soil. So the next, next slide, please. Um, understanding the original ecosystem that was at the site is where you should start, even though there is a good, you know, it's good to look at other fighter caps that have been done around the place. The best place to start is actually what used to grow at this particular location. Helps you to better define the rehabilitation objective. And it's also some, it's a place where you can start to think about some of those other values that Prashal was talking about. What other opportunities are there to reinstate some plant communities that may have been lost. And chances are, if you install an indigenous ecosystem, it is going to bring a lot more value to the area. The other thing is that an indigenous ecosystem has already done the, um, you know, well, millions or billions of years of research and development to say, I am perfectly well suited to this climate and I am really well adapted to the soils and context of this land. Um, it's good to also understand from the Indigenous ecosystem what is the dominant drivers of success. Um, so to do this, it's not a perfect science. You need to triage a range of sources, look at the regional ecosystem maps, look at local plant and soil surveys if you can. The 80s was a really wonderful time for this and some areas have some great information. Um, you can, if there's no information, you can do some ground truth surveys with local ecologists discussing with your local indigenous nurseries and bush care groups and if you um, have the privilege to also consult traditional owners in terms of um, what is appropriate for that context and, and what are the opportunities. Next one please. A landfill um, however we have to acknowledge is a disturbed site and it has had major changes in topography and drainage lines. It's also um, got a waste decomposition process that's got an happening, which is producing gas. Um, and of course, uh, we know that methane gas doesn't act, isn't detrimental to plants, but it does um, cause anoxia because um, plants respire underground and need oxygen. Um, but carbon dioxide levels that are too high can be detrimental to plants. Um, ideally, we have uh, a gas landfill gas extraction occurring at a fighter cap site. Um, also, the substrate rootable depths, um, they could be different, but generally a 1.5 metre um, depth of cap is usually more than enough to sustain a forest ecosystem. 
and a range of different um, structural layers of the plant community. And you need, but ultimately you need to analyze these differences and assess how significant they are and whether you need to make changes to your design. Rudy, Next, yeah. on the CO2 question. So what mm -hmm. percentage CO2 would be an issue? Um, there are uh, varying, <laughs> varying reports. Um, I can send you the exact data. I think, uh, I think less than five percent is not a concern from memory. Um, I would have to check that. Um, I have had plants because I chose flood tolerant plants. I have had plants growing in one hundred percent landfill gas, and I wouldn't say flourishing. I'd say surviving, as in not growing at all, but but actually. Um, you know, managed to weather the storm until the gas extraction was installed. But, um, yeah, I, I think um, it, it, you really better not to have landfill gas in your in your um, soil profile, okay. if you can. Um, so uh, also once you've got, you know, you've matched your plants, um, to your uh, uh, soils and you've looked at that changing context consider those multiple benefits you know what are the ecological values if you might have a list of 50 plant species um, that could be candidates or which one of them have high ecological value for habitat um, as food sources as host plants rare plants uh, are there traditional uses that could be um, built in in terms of medicinal properties or cultural applications? And perhaps also if it's a recreational area, what is going to provide shade, uh, canopy, beauty and interest to the people who might visit the landfill? Next one, please. So those are the four pillars essentially. Um, that first pillar helped us to define our specific um, of soil constraints, helps us to define the plant tolerances. The next one helps us understand the eco hydrological drivers. Um, the next one helps us, pillar three, helps us identify areas of risk and significance that we need to consider with the changing context. And the last pillar, multi-benefits, helps us achieve that highest level of benefit. Next, please. Um, of course, plant availability is a key consideration, the rhythm and timing of seed production and nursery stock. Um, it's important for you to think about your phytocat program um, in relationship to those good sowing times, although that doesn't always happen. Um, uh, but even though nurseries may have limited stock, you can uh, work with local nurseries, create good relationships and potentially um, work on a seed harvesting and propagation um, project specifically for your site. So um, with, with um, a good timeline, you can achieve uh, higher value um, plant outcomes in that regard. Next, please. Uh, I think I might kind of skip through some of this. I guess these are just some case studies which we can explore. Um, basically to say that very constrained soil environments. Um, next one. But then how we matched those soil environments to Indigenous plants from similar plant communities. Um, I guess uh, some of our native plant communities are living in very craggy, rocky, nutrient depleted situations. And so your craggy, you know, uh, uh, subsoil or um, stockpile might actually be, have some, you know, good attributes for reinstating these communities. And that's what I found at the Wallert site. The stony knoll grassland cliff escarpment vegetation community in the area loves already growing on a shallow basaltic profile so it didn't mind the quarry scalpings um, so I guess it's just that's that's where that matching is super important next, next slide uh, this is just I'm not going to go into this in detail but I guess this is just us looking at what was the original ecosystem um, what how is the phytocap ecosystem different and what is the significance of that difference and just looking at you know if the rootable depth was 0.3 to 1.5 in the natural ecosystem, and it's 1.5 in the phytocap, there's no risk there. But um, there may be some risks, for example, if um, if the um, pH and salinity was very acidic in the, in the natural ecosystem, but the material you're working at 
with it, the phytocat might be very alkaline. So you need to do a little bit more investigating to make sure those plants have a wide range of tolerances, as an example. Next, please. Um, it's really, uh, there are some, especially our larger animals and birds are really struggling to, to irk out an existence in our urban environments. In Southeast Queensland, there used to be millions of koalas um, and they are really struggling in quite small patches, trying to cross roads and things. There's a real opportunity to provide a big patch benefit for some of these. And um, we have, for example, um, the black cockatoos. Uh, it's not hard to incorporate uh, Alicasterina species that they like to have a pit stop on when they fly by. Um, and these are the types of opportunities you can build in with relative ease. Okay, can probably skip over that. It's a bit more detail on how, how we match those. And I guess in conclusion, um, good plant selection is worth investing in, uh, in, in um, time and energy. It's crucial for achieving engineering and multi-benefit outcomes. If we use indigenous plant species, we are really increasing our engineering success priority, um, having some confidence of their ability to operate in the local climate. But also there's these flow on benefits for, for um, local flora and potentially return of native ecosystems. Um, good matching with pollinators and animals and birds of the region. Um, and we also need to consider some of those um, uh, differences in the landfill cap and how they're going to influence our design. Next, is there one more slide perhaps? I guess um, one point that I'd really uh, like to leave on, because we've talked a lot about fighter capping and there's been a little bit of a like, there's fighter capping as an alternative to traditional capping. Um, I mean, I think fighter capping has now been around long enough to be considered a, a viable technology in its own right. But um, there is opportunities, even with barrier caps, with clay caps and geothetic synthetic caps, that they can have more ecological design. So shallow soil layers shouldn't negate return of native ecosystems to a site. Grassland ecosystems do not need a, a large depth of a profile, and I would challenge all designers um, who are looking at any type of cap for landfills to be including how can we um, restore ecological value? How can we, um, uh, especially in Victoria, and I know a lot of people probably from Victoria being a Hydra Terra webinar, but um, there's one of the most endangered ecosystems is, is native um, grasslands. And um, you have the opportunity to bring back one of the most floristically diverse um, ecosystem types um, in Victoria by reinstating native grasslands. So um, very excited to work on any projects related to ecological rehabilitation of geosynthetic and clay caps in addition to fighter caps. So Ruby, how do people get in touch with you for that? I think it's next slide, maybe. Oh, one more. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, just a final mention, and hopefully there'll be another opportunity uh, to have a presentation down the, down the track. Um, but I'm currently working with uh, Dr. Melissa Salt uh, and also Waste Management Resource Recovery Association on a proposal to update the fighter cap guidelines, which are now uh, more than 13 years old um, and were really created in the infancy of the technology in Australia and now don't really reflect our best practice. Um, Michelle, just finishing his PhD, is going to be involved with the project and expanding some of his surveys uh, to um, national audience. So watch this space. There should be some um, opportunities for you to be involved in the update of the guidelines. Um, the first step is going to be a national um, survey to gather stakeholder insights and, and find out um, what we where how far we have come and where our fighter caps are, are and what the challenges and barriers and opportunities are, um, which will form um, will be the basis of the next iteration as we move towards creating a guideline and a training program um, so that we can capitalize on the technology. 
And finally, I've got my contact there at the end of the slides and uh, welcome to get in touch. And um, me or Vishal, um about any Clidercat related questions. Very good. Thanks, Ruby. We better move Thank to you. early bird <laughs> questions. Thanks. Um, okay, first question. So this is both for Ruby and Vishal. For older landfills that were capped only with low permeability soil of varying thicknesses and qualities, vegetation often grows on these sites such as council reserves. It is frequently recommended to remove this vegetation as part of rehabilitation efforts based on the assumption that root systems may create preferential pathways for stormwater and landfill gas. Do you have any comments or experiences regarding this issue? Um, thank you for the question. I I would say that uh, if vegetation is is growing on the the cap, it usually and flourishing, it's usually an indication that you know it's not there's not a huge volume of of gas coming out of the um the landfill. I um I am personally don't find it of concern, and I think it really depends on the level of risk associated with the particular landfill site. So if it is an older site, um, I, I think it's a different, potentially a different question if we're um, talking about, um, um, you know, a, a, a high risk site. Um, but, you know, if it is, if it's already largely degassed itself and, you um, is sitting there, I would just allow natural rehabilitation to occur. Um, I think one of the other things is old sites often sit uncapped for uh, decades and then um, a cap is put on and then we're really concerned about preferential flow. And I would say if the landfill is low risk, no discharges, then I wouldn't be concerned. Yeah. Uh, I would just add a point to that. We have already like a lot of legacy sites that has trees growing on it. Uh, and uh, I've seen a couple of them in my travel in Queensland. Uh, and um, yeah, if the, again, if the trees are growing, that means that there's not much uh, gas and toxic in, inside there to worry about. All right. Interesting to hear what the auditors have to say, I suppose. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, we are not auditors. <laughs> Listen to your auditor. <laughs> Next question. Have you measured methane emissions and performance of phytocaps? What about gas extraction system performance, drawing oxygen into the profile or, I guess, out of the profile? Um, I have a fair bit of experience with my PhD site on this, so we actually cut um large fighter cap test sections into an existing clay cap uh, this is at the wallet landfill um, they're producing quite a high amount of landfill gas because they had recent um, leachate recirculation and it was a young landfill young and large landfill and um, so initially the plants had we had 100 percent landfill gas in the soil profile um, after, because the fighter cap sections were, were actually installed prior to the gas extraction so I had um, phytocap plants sitting there in 100% landfill gas, which is what I mentioned to Richard earlier, and um, did see some negative effects on the plants in terms of, you know, red leaves and stunted and things like that. And um, But when the gas extraction um, commenced, uh, it just drew all of that uh, landfill gas out of the soil profile. And speaking with the landfill gas operators there, there was um, no concern. So just um, in terms of drawing oxygen, I guess it was drawn from uh, the landfill gas has been extracted from underneath the cap and um, it didn't cause any um, performance issues. Does it enhance the growth because you're pulling oxygen further into the profile? <sighs> I don't know about that. I actually don't. I mean, from the landfill gas monitoring that I did in the profile, it seemed like it just approximated normal atmospheric concentrations when the landfill gas was, was um, landfill gas extraction was operating. All right. Next question: Where do landfills generally source the soil for phytocap? 
how easy is it to increase the nutrient content of the top 100 millimetres? Mm -hmm. um, so landfills generally source the soil. So within a 20 kilometre radius of a landfill site is probably the most practical haulage distance, you know, in terms of making it economically feasible for you to um, cart in soil. But that can also be for clay as well. Um, so some landfills have on-site stockpiles, large on-site stockpiles. It depends if it's like at the at the Wallert site and indeed the Newcham landfill site that we work with up here, they were had past extractive activities. So we've used coal overburden um, and we've also used quarry scalpings. So it's on-site sources. Um, they can also, soil can also be sourced from large uh, council um infrastructure projects that are going on. Um, the, I guess one of it, the challenges when you don't have one consistent soil source, you can manage it, but if you have a, a patchwork quilt of different types of soils that you would like to use, it makes it a little more challenge for um, quality assurance and making sure that you have, um, you know, a, a good outcome, but it can, it can, um, still be achieved and I guess that second question um how is it easy is it to increase the nutrient content of the top 100 mil do you need to increase the nutrient content of the top 100 mil because I think there can be a bit of an assumption that high nutrients is good but it can actually you might end up um creating an unnecessary weed problem by increasing the nutrients of the top 100 mil so a lot of our native plants are really well adapted to low nutrients. So it actually makes them more competitive and at an advantage compared to our weed species when you've got low nutrients within reason. That's a part of your service, isn't it? Matching up. <laughs> yeah. Plant selection. Matchmaking. Matchmaking. The dating agency for soil and plant. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Photo cap construction in dry weather. As I say in the Pilbara, how would you go about that? Um, well, I guess the question is, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I guess um, if this, if the soil profile, the soil profile itself in very, very dry environments may be doing most of the work already um without the the plant community um the best bet is to look to your surrounding ecosystems for clues as to what is going to establish well and to also speak to your um locals <laughs> um if i was uh working in the pilbara i would be speaking to people with a good understanding of pilbara conditions and pilbara plants and soils really as a starting point um, is that uh, hopefully that's related to that that question? But I think so. But I guess the question really is, um, like, let's say there's spinifex grass all around. Mm -hmm. So you'd be looking to get a seed bank of spinifex, would you, and plant spinifex? Absolutely. I mean, I, I guess that's where that putting the energy and time into understanding the drivers on that particular context is where you're going to get a good result. Because you definitely you're not gonna you're gonna lose if you try to create a forest, <laughs> greeny you know an oasis, um, when it's not appropriate for the local context. So usually the plant community that has evolved there is roughly indicating to you what the um, what the natural hydrological drivers are. It's a real balance between that hydrological and the biodiversity side of things, isn't it? Things. Yeah. All right, next dot point. I recall a grant by ARC to Melbourne University in early 2000s to evaluate phytocap performance. Did you incorporate this work? So um, the ARC linkage, which was the Australian Alternative Covers Assessment Program, started in 2005. Um, my phytocap research was in 2004. Um, or began in 2004, but definitely the, the current fighter cap guideline is an output of that ARC linkage. And um, I think, um, and that was published in 2010. And, and since then we've, we've had another 
you know, more than a decade of, of research and more importantly, experience. And so in that guidelines, that guideline document is direct outcome of that ARC linkage. Um, that guideline um, was intended to be updated after five years. But definitely we incorporate all of the fighter cap research that is being done in Australia as part of building on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> As they do you think say. it's changed? Next question. Do you think it's changed much in the last 15 to 20 years? Um, I think it has not changed probably enough. Um, I would have liked to have seen more flourishing potential by now, but um, as Vishal's research has indicated, and I'll hand over to you, Vishal, in terms of maybe you can speak to some of the um what we found what you found in Queensland um, um related to you know what the barriers um that have prevented I guess fighter capping from flourishing. Yeah. So some of the key findings with fighter capping, uh, especially in barriers, is uh uh lack of expertise when it comes to consulting companies, because most of the landfill owners would go to a consulting company and uh, because there is lack of knowledge in, uh, in between them, what happens is they end up giving what they've been doing, which is barrier style capping and uh, no option for para capping. And if the client asks for para capping specifically, what happened is like they would go for the best topsoil and end up uh, being overestimating the price of it and becoming out of choice. That's one main thing we found. And also lack of uh, incentives and uh, uh, especially like waste industry is focused on safe, stable, non-polluting. That's key. But what's beyond that, uh, that's not being considered. So what happens to landfill when it becomes safe, stable and non-polluting? That's not considered. And that lack of long-term planning is also a key contributor to uh, as a barrier to pyrocapping. Um, Michelle, you, you say there's not incentives, but what about these biodiversity credits and things that have come out? Are they not? Yeah, because uh, the, 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 these, uh, uh, this is rooted into, into legislation. So the overarching issue is uh, regulations and legislation where landfill space uh, is under, um, uh, under Environment Protection Act and rest of these uh, incentives and all this are uh, Natural Protection Act, uh, uh, Environment, uh, Natural Protection Act, I think I, I may be getting the names wrong, but they're two piece of legislation and they don't interact with each other, even though there's a huge opportunity for achieving this outcome from landfills. So that's the overarching uh, cause for this uh, discrepancy between this uh, legislation. Sounds like we need some policy reform. Yes, that's what it's pointing to. All of my finding. That's interesting. Uh, next question. Are there any potential chances that the clean energy regulator will change the collection coefficient from 75% to 95%? I am not sure about that question. Okay, we, we can say <laughs> I don't know what the chances are there. Um, Michelle? Um, no, me neither. I'm not an expert in clean energy. <laughs> All right, we'll take that one on notice and come back to you. Next question. Why has it taken so long when... I started with advising Mornington Council Zero Waste. I remember the Zero Waste strategy with five plus councillors back in 2007. Why has what taken so long? Um, so I guess. Why, why are you coming? Mm. Good question. <laughs> um, I think, uh, look, nature based solutions in general suffer often from the same um like like we have we, we we have a um a difficulty with integrating nature-based solutions generally um we have a really strong emphasis in the way our caps are, are regulated on um pollution uh risk and um and we have possibly an overemphasis on on modeling 
and an underemphasis on um, uh, soil and plant design. So I think we've put our emphasis in the wrong place. Um, there's definitely mixed messages uh, for landfill owners out there in terms of their options and the level of risk associated with them. And um, I think there is, because of the strong regulatory environment, there definitely is a, um, a bias, a natural bias towards business as usual um, because it's safer, um, the, you know, it's and it's well understood and um, the consulting teams are, are comfortable delivering um, right. are within that paradigm as well. But um, so I, I think those things probably yeah. have so been is, challenging. Uh, this is one of the findings my, from my research, like resistance to change or adapting a new technology where they have been comfortable doing uh, same thing for years. And when something new that is a different paradigm would come in, uh, there's a resistance to change. Isn't it not that the paradigm is is that a landfill or a, a former landfill is a liability on a on a balance sheet? Yeah. And yeah. Is it... yeah. Go ahead, Ruby. No, sorry, Richard. But isn't that the primary driver? So like a council or whoever are trying to reduce their risk threshold and by definitely, definitely engineered. So Maybe it's a modification to the closure guidelines that so you bring those two differential pieces together, the biodiversity piece and, and the... That's right, yeah. I mean, I think resistance to change is definitely um, well understood and, and, and makes a lot of sense as to why there is that resistance because, um, you know, uh, why put your neck out if you don't feel that you have the confidence and, and that confidence is very important in a risk environment i think so, one thing you said earlier was interesting which is even with a traditional cap that maybe we should be considering the biodiversity opportunity as well so it's then they can tick off on both right definitely and i think we should strongly be uh moving in that direction so i guess not the there is a really strong emphasis in the in in landfills in particular on the cap just being for hydraulic containment. But I think there are um, those broader after use and ecological rehabilitation outcomes that should be fulfilled through the capping process. So that's the return of the site back to a valuable after use. And, and those biodiversity values are becoming ever more critical and important to incorporate. Um, it also is just a, it's a great outcome for a company to leave with, um, you know, a good feeling of returning um, something that has provided a huge service to the community in waste containment back to community and back, back to nature at the end. There's also these commercial incentives like biodiversity offsets and things, but um, we probably should move on to the yeah. next question. How critical are moisture probes in lysimeter monitoring? Mm -hmm. I guess... <laughs> They are very important in lysimeter monitoring uh, because you really want that diagnostic capacity to actually see water moving down through the lysimeter. I know at Walla we we had hardly any water coming in the, <laughs> into the lysimeter pan at any point, and indeed ended up. Um, I think Sam ended up putting a pipe <laughs> right down to the actual hole. Um, the drainage hole into the lysimeter to just to make sure it was working and it indeed was working. But um, one, so one thing that is interesting, so the wallet landfill, we used quarry scalpings. Um, uh, if you look at all of the tests uh, that relate to modeling, it shouldn't have performed well. But one thing that is really badly understood by models is the plant community and how successful they are at extracting water. And so the cap, even though the materials were not ideal, the cap remained relatively bone dry, close to wilting point um, for the duration of the study. It was really important for us to be able to look at the moisture content profiles and see why that was happening. So it, it's um, we could see that there was it was completely dry at depth, 
but it was still responsive to rainfall at the surface. So that's the importance of the, the moisture content probes within a lysimeter situation. The real question is, are lysimeters needed? <laughs> Um, we don't have lysimeters for clay caps and geosynthetic caps. When arguably we could still be monitoring those caps using lysimeters as well. Um, why has fighter capping been hampered by um, this need for lysimeters? I think there is an overemphasis on lysimeters as a monitoring and the five-year monitoring. There is an overemphasis on modeling, and the true emphasis should be on really good ecological design. So good soil design, good plant design. If you get a flourishing system, you're very close to achieving the objectives. And then you can have your soil moisture probes in your full scale cap showing you that the system is working. Um, that would be, I, I think that is the proper emphasis. Um, and that uh, regulatory uh, period of five years when people are not planning that far ahead is is a real barrier. It's interesting though, like um, the confidence in people being able to establish a really effective fighter cap is low. So therefore yeah. you want to monitor that they can actually do it. And then if they can't, well, they shouldn't. Right. The so problem, yeah, the problem is that so if you if the lysimeters don't often reflect the final cap outcome. <laughs> well, they might well. over five years. <laughs> All right, better move on. Um, what are the risks of contaminant uptake by plants becoming available to ecosystems? Uh, th this really depends on the contaminants within your landfill and the types of plants that you have planted and how far those plants potentially are ingressing into those contaminated areas. So the fighter cap itself, if it's 1.5 metres as an example, is providing the majority of the soil profile needs for the plant community and is uncontaminated. However, you know, there, there are potential opportunities um, for, you know, plants to grow deeper than that. And I think... Uh, another thing, I guess, to note is that um, contaminants move into different plant parts of plants depending on the plant type. So not all plants will uptake or accumulate metals. And if they do, it's not necessarily going to go into certain parts of the plant. So they'll petition into roots or they'll petition, and, you know, petition into to to leaves but not necessarily into fruits and things like that so i think it's something that if it's a highly contaminated site you definitely want don't want to be planting a, a hyper accumulating plant but if a fairly ordinary plant the risk may be low but should be considered all right i'm going to have to do a few captain's picks because we're nearly at two o'clock all right finish up soon yes. mm -hmm. so i'll just Ask a couple. Can the root zone create a preferential pathway for methane release? Um, I think this is not a question that I love to be honest. Um, but I think um, ideally we have landfill gas extraction. Yeah. And that's probably um, where I'd end that there are potential benefits in a very, very, in a low emission situation um, from plants and plant microbial associations for methane oxidation as well. Um, I think it's not clear. Uh, I do know that, um, yeah, in the, in the original fighter cap site at Woolert, they actually have, you know, they have lower, lower, um, hit submissions on that on that particular site but they do have gas extraction than than some of the other cap areas okay um with respect to optimizing soil compaction where et capping layers are over compacted is ripping the surface to say 300 millimeters an option 
It's an option, yes. It's one of it's it's one option. It's not an ideal. It's a maybe then. <laughs> maybe. All right. Just I think it depends on the objective and what plants you're trying to establish. Um, but definitely if you're um but like you alluded to earlier as well, Richard, there are some, you know, you, you, if the rainfall is not super high, you might be able to get some eucalypts established or something like that within the ripping lines that then over time are going to develop bigger roots that can penetrate the compacted layers. But it's not an optimal scenario. All right. I'm just moving to the Q&A questions. Apologies, people, for having to be... So it's mm. active, but um, I think perhaps we'll commit to sending out some answers to other questions a bit later, or we might record some answers to add to the recording. Um, now, here's one from Brent Davey. He's a long-term legend in uh, phytocapping, so we probably should respect that and read his one out. Mm. With respect to the change in practice, generally landfill operators still have a pre phytocap mentality and don't yes. realise that phytocaps require a completely different approach, such as not mowing the grasses. Okay. Thank uh, you, Brent. <laughs> barriers to adoption. Possibly there aren't enough examples of effective phytocaps. Exactly. Yeah. Vicious circle. Both of those are true. And um, especially with, we are, and this is way bigger than landfills, we are stuck in a weed spraying and mowing paradigm in general in the urban greening space. And uh, internationally, you see over in Europe, there's a, a much greater emphasis now on unmowed areas and, and recognising that unmowed um, grasses and especially Indigenous grasses provide space for nesting birds and pollinators and we, we need flowers to grow and those types of things so i think definitely we have an entrenched um, mowing paradigm but the great thing is if you stop mowing you also um get to do less mowing <laughs> which is good but you have to still manage of course you know your risk of fire and various things like that um but that can be accommodated all right last question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. appropriately from the traditional owners will there be engagement with traditional owners in the process of updating the phytocapping guidelines that's a good question i would love that i i would absolutely love that um i guess um i i think um absolutely so important and a, a question that i do uh, have asked myself and indeed uh, landfill was part of country like anything else and and um is and and when you're undertaking fighter capping you're starting to to rebuild country in some sense traditional owner point of view is always really valued um and i would say that that would definitely be something that I would value and be open to and updating the guidelines. And I guess perhaps maybe it's a, a framework for considering how um, cultural ecological values could be incorporated um, into the meaningfully into the design process. Yeah, it seems that whole closure planning piece needs to be integrated more with the ecological and... Maybe. I mean, the, the plant selection space is a good time to consider that, really. So if you have a process of selecting plants and that pillar, which is about multi-benefits, where it's kind of traditional um, values, is an opportunity for that consultation to occur through the design process and um, to make the outcome even richer through that knowledge and understanding being incorporated. All right. Well, we're over time. I um, just really want to thank both Ruby and Vishal for putting on such a great presentation. I thought it was excellent and thought-provoking. So thank you so much. And um, congratulations once more, Vishal, officially a doctor very, very soon. So Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for attending. And uh, thank you very much, Ruby and Vishal. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And welcome to Reach Out. Um, if you have any other burning questions that emerge after the presentation, um, we would love to chat. Excellent.
Excellent. Thanks, Thanks Richard and Hydroterra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye you. For now.